Hello, everyone. A, a warm welcome to a very wonderful evening. Today we have uh, uh, approximately on the last day of this year. Uh, we are gathered around here for a very wonderful talk uh, as part of our Nature in Our Cities webinar series. Now, this series has been brought to you by Azim Premji University. The idea behind it is to talk about, you know, species of animals and all that live around us, not necessarily in, uh, you know, wildlife parks and forests, but they, they all, you know, occupy the spaces around us. And through this series in the past, we have, we have spoken about numerous, you know, uh, we have been introduced to numerous species. We have spoken about them, be it frogs, earthworms, even leopards, macaques, and, you know, a whole range of them. Today we have uh, we have as our guest a very special, fascinating species that I've been you know wanting to do, do know for a long time. That's bats. Um, so I I relocated to Bangalore uh, pretty recently, and one of the things that has fascinated me is seeing those you know in the evenings I see all this whole flock of flying foxes you know moving towards from one area to the other, ostensibly to Lalbagh to you know feed on the figs that are on offer there. So that has been that has been my you know. Uh, very interesting introduction to them and through that uh, we have been wanting to know more about what bats mean for us there are there's so many things you know when you speak about bats typically people get very scared very and you know kind of uh, uh, they feel different kind of uh, emotions not necessarily one of you know uh, welcoming ones so we have a set of experts with us today to kind of take us through what exactly these bats are, what they mean for us, what roles they play in our ecology, and you know how we can coexist with them in our cities. So, you know, to do the uh, honor for us, we have uh, Rohit, Rohit Chakravarti. He's a bat researcher. He's currently doing his PhD at the Institute for Zoo and Wildlife, Wildlife Research in Germany. And over the past eight years, he has been studying bats in Andaman or Uttarakhand, and also authored a you know co-authored a book. Naturalist Guide to Mammals of India. Welcome on board, Rohit. Yeah, and we have, yeah, so we have Bahiratan M who's joining, uh, you know, uh, who's giving company to Rohit and he'll be talking about, you know, bats, uh, specifically flying foxes. He has completed his PhD on visual ecology of petropoded bats of southern India. And he is also, you know, co-founder of a research officer at Vavil Center for Indian Bat Research on Ecosystem Sustainability. Thank you so much, Bahi, as we call him Bahi. Yes. Yeah. And finally, uh, our moderator for the evening who will be taking us through the whole session is, uh, uh, is a colleague and a faculty at uh, Azim Premji University. She's an ecologist who has been studying bird communities in different habitats, including green spaces, of wonderful places like the Hiradun and Uttarakhand. And she has done her, you know, uh, doctoral degree in wildlife science from Wildlife Institute of uh, India from Saurash to Gujarat. So welcome on board, uh, Monica. Uh, thank you so much for taking this thing, uh, trouble and, you know, putting this together. I know this is uh, a fascinating way to end our uh, 2022 uh, season for our, this thing. Uh, just one request to all the viewers here. You can type in your questions, whatever questions you might have in the live chat box. Uh, we will try to take them up towards the end of the program. Uh, so without much ado, let me hand over the baton to you, Monica. The stage is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shashwat. It's a pleasure to actually host Rohit. Um, our paths crossed when I was uh, in Dehradun and he came there to study bats. So it's really a pleasure to host Rohit and to also know Bahi through Rohit. I am really uh, glad that uh, Rohit made uh, this request and uh, we will be learning about flying foxes from Bahi. Uh, so welcome uh, Rohit and Bahi from my side as well. Um, before we start, actually something that was bothering me um, is as B uh, Shashwat was saying that as a kid, we were, I mean, at least I was really scared. We were told that the bats will come and they'll go into your ear. So we would simply cover our ear whenever there are bats roaming around. <laughs> but in a when I was doing my PhD, that time I realized that there were a lot of people who were working on very charismatic species, working on bird was not even charismatic enough for me. So I just wanted to know in a landscape where there is a lot of love and favor for charismatic mammal species, why did you choose this species? What made you choose uh, bats, both of you?
Tahi, so you can go first. Yeah. Yeah. For, yeah. Sure. So yeah, I have uh, interviewed and the chance to back. So so we always like get opportunity for us to export a time. So yeah. So why is it that is like uh, so I have a different story because uh, I. I in my childhood I was always interested in Bhai there but, seemed to uh, be some issue uh, we, I, we are unable to hear you properly can I uh, just request Rohit to go first and then you can uh, I hope by that time your network would be better and then you can uh, pitch it No problem yeah I'll I'll take yeah, over yeah. then so uh, yeah that's a very good good that's a very interesting question to start with uh, monica and uh, with me in my case uh, i was well i was always fascinated with uh, small mammals i mean when when my aunt gifted me a book the book of indian mammals uh, uh, as soon as i uh, after i got interested in wildlife uh, my eyes actually fell more on the smaller species because i've been watching mongooses around my house uh, all along all all the time i think mongooses was probably the first wild animal i saw in my life and i still hold uh, that animal in very high regard so but then i realized that you know apart from mongooses there are so many other uh, species uh, that we don't really know much about so um, so my eyes immediately fell on those species but uh, that interest rather stayed dormant for a very long time i mean it got i got distracted with birds and you know i mean it's a, it there's a great species to be uh, that's a great taxon to be distracted by and suddenly uh, thankfully during uh, uh, my time in bombay when i was doing my uh, bachelor's i realized that people were able to hear a lot more birds than i could and i thought Uh, i mean with this kind of hearing you know i really can't study birds even though even if i would like to and then i thought okay what could what what is that animal that uh, i could study which nobody else is studying and then my uh, then the memories of bats came back to my mind and i had rescued a couple of bats in nagpur uh, which is my hometown so so you know those memories came back and i thought okay let's just start exploring caves and uh, in bombay and uh, then everything you know everything went in that direction i really st- uh, i love the adventure that studying bats brings along uh, i love the fact that whatever you study turns out to be new so you know and it it turned out to be a great decision in the end so it started with looking for an empty niche and i think it uh, that that is what guide is guiding my interest and my uh, career these days Wow. what a fascinating story rohit <laughs> bhai it looks like your network is better do you want to answer that question yeah can you hear me now yes yeah yeah sorry sorry about the internet so yeah so uh, why study bats so was like uh, so i was already always interested in animals from my childhood but uh, when i went to college i started as a bioengineer so i did my engineering in biotechnology and then i moved to a masters in genomics where uh, i landed up in this uh, department which was working with bats for 40 years in uh, madurai kamarajar university so they were known for uh, studying uh, bat behavior for uh, almost 3 decades in my before and uh, just entering into the lab for my masters dissertation was the starting my pen to look into bat behavior so we uh, uh, period of research but uh, what fast Uh, so, uh, 90 started studying uh, olfactory communication in one species of uh, fruit bat. Then, uh, followed by that, I continued for my PhD with uh, another sensory system, which was the visual system. So, my, the, my my starting point was entering into this department, which was working with bats for a long time. wow very nice uh, bhai i did not know that there are labs that are working for so long on bats thank you so much um, i actually wanted to this is i think uh, you started it really well bhai maybe you can just continue and tell us more about um, uh, about your research and some key finding if you can share at this time
if bahis internet is uh, giving us trouble then i request rohit uh, rohit do you want to share briefly about the type of research that you are conducting so uh, as of yet and yeah. uh, some key finding okay so um, so i um, uh, and the, the like like you described during uh, during while introducing me our paths crossed in uttarakhand and those were those were very memorable days when for the readers uh, for the for the for the audience when monica and i were also flatmates for a while and i pet sat uh, her dog for uh, for a while uh, during those days i did a survey of bats in uttarakhand and you know a survey is always a starting point to know which species there are what kind of diversity there is um, also their echolocation calls because there are different species produce different uh, echolocation calls which i was recording and you know documenting the entire diversity now the immediate question that came after that was you know um, what is like how is this diversity uh, distributed in different parts of uh, uttarakhand in different parts of mountain of of the same mountain range and this can give us insights on you know um when these bats in prehistoric times when these bats colonized a particular region how did they distribute themselves what are the kind of interactions that might have happened in between species so these were questions that i was rather interested in and it all starts with another sort of description so my phd is about um how um is about how bat different species of bats uh, how the diversity of bats which is the different species changes across a gradient of elevation uh, and i'm doing this in kedarnath wildlife sanctuary which is uh, which has a very interesting gradient from uh, 1500 meters all the way up to 3500 meters um and in a nutshell what we've observed so far so the phd is still ongoing but in a nutshell what I, what we've observed so far is that uh, a yes the species diversity decreases as you go from low to high elevations which is quite expected but you know species diversity uh, or species richness it only tells you uh, the number of species it does not tell you anything about what those species are how uh, evolutionarily related they might be so there's another component of diversity which is called functional diversity in which you measure different traits of an animal so in the, in the case of bats these could be morphological traits of related to their wings how they whether their wings are broad narrow because these govern how bats can how bats can fly from uh, and hunt how bat, how different species of bats hunt insects so uh, even though species diversity was declining from low to high elevations uh, we observed that uh, simultaneously functional diversity also declined so you know not just the number of species was declining but the kind of um hunting strategies so to say or you know the kind of functions that they perform in the ecosystem the diversity of those were also declining across uh, the elevation gradient and uh, but we in the second chapter of my thesis i also see something quite interesting that at the highest elevation where you would expect you know the conditions are uh, quite uh, demanding and quite challenging so there's more pressure on species occurring in that place to avoid competition among each other for resources for example you know if they're feeding on the same ki- kind of insects they want to they might want to uh, you know diverge and feed on different kinds of insects and that's what we are observing that they that they that the few bats that there are at high elevations they segregate their niches quite uh, um, quite efficiently wow that's very fascinating to know uh, bhai i'll repeat my question for you i just wanted uh, you to summarize uh, your research very briefly and if you can just share few key findings of your work just for our viewers to uh, know more about the type of work that you have been doing Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can uh, can you hear hear me? Yes, yes. I'll just put my camera off for some time. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. So what my research focuses on is uh, only this uh, about the uh, sensory ecology of fruit bats. So if. Uh, uh, if the if most of the audience did not know there is this exclusive family of uh, bats uh, 
called family teropodidae which do not echolocate which means uh, they, they predominantly rely on the sense of smell and vision for their flight and foraging activities and my focus has been on this particular family for the last 8 years i started with one species which is the short nosed fruit bat which is a harem forming species where uh, the male will construct a tent by altering tree foliage and it will attract females for uh, uh, their day roosting so i started by under- trying to understand uh, the usage of smell in their uh, social communication so that was my master's dissertation so i presented the scents of uh, different males to females and asked them to choose uh, whether they are choosing the scent of the male which they are associated with or they, can they differentiate different males based on their scent and uh, that was my master's dissertation for my phd i moved on to a second sense which was the visual sense and for this i took a comparative approach so uh, in uh, southern india uh, there are different uh, types of fruit bats one is this uh, harem roosting uh, uh, short nosed fruit bats which kind of uh, lives in an intermediate daylight exposed uh, situation and there are also cave roosting fruit bats which is uh, for one example is the fulvus fruit bat which we can find in temples uh, uh, like uh, archaeological sites and even in deep caves so that is also a fruit bat but it lives inside caves and there is also this uh, famous flying fox which is uh, always known to roost in open tree branches exposed to broad daylight so for my phd i took a comparative approach and i compared their visual system in all these three species and investigated how their daylight exposure itself is going to define or have an influence on their visual system and their uh, light based uh, foraging behavior so uh, in that i took different approaches one i took a neuroanatomical approach and uh, estimated the visual acuity or spatial resolution by understanding their retinal uh, neuronal structure and map their retina so uh, uh, so in the slides you can see the six common fruit bat species found in southern india so this is the greater short nosed fruit bat chain i was mentioning about that was a harem structure in which uh, uh the male will construct a form of harem and it will recruit females the colony size can go up to 5 to 20 individuals and there are also this cave roosting uh, uh, species which is the fulvus fruit bat salimali fruit bat and the cave nectar bat and uh, the, also this open roosting uh, indian flying fox so i took a neuroanatomical approach to understand how better their visual system itself is second uh, i also understood uh, how their uh, roost bait based flight uh, activity differs with respect to moon phases and uh, twilight timing so if an animal is to be uh, dependent on visual system it uh, the ambient lighting itself is a major cue for them so i wanted to compare uh, if daylight exposure is uh, uh, important uh, how how much daylight exposure is playing a role in their light based uh, foraging behavior so that was uh, one part of my phd second uh, the next part was uh, uh, about uh, understanding the, so this was all under natural conditions then i also asked what happens when light pollution comes into picture because these are all animals which are exposed to constant levels of light pollution and uh, if uh, 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 daylight exposure or ambient lighting is going to have a say on this behavior of these animals i wanted to know how artificial lighting induced by human activities is going to have an effect that i compared in the two extreme species which is the bright roosting flying fox and the dark roosting uh, fulvus fruit bat and um, uh, i also went and did gps tracking on the indian flying foxes because there is one seed animal with respect to movement ecology and i asked if individual itself changes their movement patterns with respect to moonlight and ambient lighting and how well their uh, understanding of landscape and how how well their visual map based uh, movement system is uh, m- movement is based on their visual system and do they memorize landmarks and all those things so that is uh, overall uh, my research so far i started with olfactory system and i f- did my phd in visual system all on this non echolocating family of bats which is the fruit bats amazing bahi that's a lot <laughs> i am so impressed by the amount of work that you could manage to do in your phd uh, looking forward for uh, publications from this work uh, bahi uh, i mean i have a, a question that i thought that i'll ask you later um, but you were talking about uh, uh, light pollution so um, because the series is around nature in cities um, i was wondering if you can um, share more light on how uh, light pollution affect uh, species like uh, uh, the one that you are studying that does not depend on eco location but on uh, vision for hunting what have been your uh, i mean are there areas that they avoid or certain time of the uh, night that they are using for hunting etc yeah 
did not get the question what was that i'm just trying to understand for instance if there is a, a more bright light at night but certain areas are dark do they uh, prefer those areas for uh, for foraging or um, or is it uh, i mean they are using some other method for foraging bhai could you hear me I just want to inform our viewers that Bahi is joining us all the way from his field. So <laughs> I would keep this question for later, maybe. Um, but uh, one question that I wanted to uh, ask both of you is: This is a, um, I mean, although it's a very fascinating species to work on, um, a group actually, not a species group to work on. But I'm assured that there will be challenges to study. such a species that uh, <laughs> roost at such high uh, great heights and uh, i mean um, work or forage or roost at night so i just wanted to not roost roost at night forage at night so i just wanted to know what challenges you have faced in your um, field work and how did you overcome those challenges i think uh, okay i'll go first while bahi uh, sorts his internet uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Uh, and actually this is a great question for both of us because we work on completely different systems you know i mean bahi uh, deals with more with urban semi urban landscapes but mine is completely in very natural uh, landscapes in mountains um the challenges are that you know the first level of challenge is completely internal you have to get over the fear of working at night and uh, the second challenge is with respect to the team because the team also has the same uh, problems most uh, most people i've worked with uh, have done their field work only during the daytime so you know they have to be conditioned to uh, to start working at night um and in a place like uttarakhand that's not easy because uh, because there are lepers there are bears so you know everybody even even locals in uh, uttarakhand are not really comfortable going out at night so um, so those are the first set of challenges the second set of challenges are uh, for me were logistical to understand uh, so thankfully for with respect to bats the um, the permit situation was relatively easy you know bats unfortunately are not protected uh, but for researchers like us it makes things easy because uh, permits are not a big hassle sometimes the forest department itself does not understand why i am applying for a permit uh, but uh, but but then uh, the next part of the problem is that um, the by logistical problems i meant uh, that in order to catch bats you need very very specific uh, areas so i had to uh, i had to scout around the landscape trying to find um streams and uh, you know streams in different areas so sometimes streams that run ran through dense forest streams that ran through or that ran through open forest so sometimes this was hard to uh, to find and in order to even if you found a stream you would have to find the right stream where you could put a net you know if it's at an incline then it doesn't make any difference because the bat could just you know just be flying over the net so uh, so those were the main uh, challenges in my area uh, yeah and and the second one was also uh, getting information from locals so prior to uttarakhand i worked in the andamans and uh, over there i noticed that you know the locals were a lot more active in terms of uh exploring the forests at night of course because you know in andamans there are no uh, predators so people are more uh, comfortable exploring the forests at night and um they had a lot more information about where caves are that was the not that was not the case in uttarakhand so every time i asked people about uh, caves i would be led to you know just a small depression of a, in a, in in the rock and obviously you know there would not be any bats and i remember one particular time we trekked 5 kilometers downhill 5 kilometers uphill because somebody told us they had a cave or they they knew of a cave and it turned out to be you know in one of these depressions <laughs> so uh, so these were some challenges that i faced during my field work they were exciting in their own way so yeah <laughs> bahi i was just asking uh, i mean it must be hard to work on a species that uh, uh, goes so high so i just wanted to know what challenges you face in your field work and especially working in an 
urban areas where people are probably <laughs> asking you 100 question about what you have been working on uh, with this particular species do you want to share some interesting story from field bhai could you hear me okay it looks like bhai's internet uh, is giving lot of trouble <laughs> i think i lost question ha huh, okay yeah so feel stories we have so much to talk about but yeah working as i said uh, as rohit was mentioning uh, working in urban and semi uh, yeah uh, so working in uh, urban and semi urban landscapes has uh, its own uh, level of complications because uh, we'll be working with uh, more uh, more closely with human habitation and uh, even though we have permits um, everything there will be so much of public attention on us especially in the nights uh, for me i was going and observing bats throughout the nights in their natural habitats at their roosts so it this involved uh, like simple uh, like open highways and uh, like uh, in uh, middle of city centers and etc so in the night if you are and observing bats throughout the night we have like uh, bright lights torches and everything and if you're doing that in a residential area it's going to have its own problems and questions yeah. will be there so that yeah. itself was an interesting experience and for me in, at least in semi urban landscapes i will take help from the local uh, villagers and uh, so you need to have a dialogue for, with them first initially some of them will not be so initially some of them will not be that open to let you inside their farmland or anything to just to go and sit and count bats in the night but uh, once you explain the uh, what i'm trying to do or uh, what is the pur- purpose of my uh, research here and uh, some farmers try to accept them and do things but in urban areas it's even more uh, uh, interesting because uh, urban public are not that very open as when compared to rural public at least in my experience so even if you try to get make them understand uh, like they just have a in a pair of uh, like uh, why is this person coming and why should i come and uh, why should i let you inside my uh, land or house or anything so and working from streets uh, like for urban areas observation points itself will be in streets only so most of the times and doing that in the night will have its own interesting things uh, in the night it will be calm uh, less traffic and all those things but uh, uh, sometimes that it's will be like uh, if, the, if the, you are the only person with uh, headlamps and torches standing in the middle of the road looking at the sky it 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 will uh, invoke certain questions no so uh, yeah. other than that um, uh as uh, k- when it comes to species specific uh, stories like different species have their own way to observe for the flying foxes you should stand around the tree and try to count them uh, as and when they fly out so if you want to but uh, for the uh, harem roosting species you should uh, li- go, literally go under the tree and uh, observe them from the underside of the trent- tent and you cannot use high beam uh, torches as you use for flying foxes because you should focus on the tent and white light is something which will disturb their behavior so you used to have red filters and two observations like that for the cave roosting species it is advantageous if there is only one entrance because you can sit at that entrance point and do your counting or observe whatever you want to do but if there are multiple entrances uh, that is again going to be a problem so so overall you should go and standardize certain things as and when the uh, studies happen and if, uh, if it is observational it is more easier if you want to go and do capture and handling studies that is again a different story so uh, so overall put together it is a uh, uh, process of learning from each experience so every day is a new day for mm-hmm. us and uh, even though we know we have been working with these animals for a long time every day there will be something new for us to learn and there will be something interesting and that is what keeps us running also nicely put thank you bahi uh, so i just wanted to uh, share my uh, experience uh, very briefly i'll do that <laughs> i uh, have uh, as shashwat was also sharing that one uh, very fascinating thing is to see uh, flying foxes uh, going from one side to the other and there is this trail of flying foxes um so the other day i was also watching them and that reminded me of a story uh, that my mother used to tell me when i was young not of uh, uh, flying foxes or bats but of a mouse who would come at night and help a fa- uh, a tailor to stitch his clothes and i was wondering that it actually uh, has lot of similarity to the function that the bats uh, uh, i mean do in 
let's say rural areas or urban areas unfortunately it go unnoticed not not many people know the services that we get from um from flying foxes or from insectivorous birds so i requested uh, i request both of you to share some um i mean other than the usual one that we know if you can share what ecological function uh, bats especially flying foxes bahi if you can talk about that and insectivorous bird rohit if you can talk about that okay i oh yeah bahi bol Okay, I'll I'll take over until Bayes internet stabil uh, stabilizes. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, so in, insectivorous bats, uh, like uh, I mean, um, they yeah. If you if you've noticed a bat, um, <clears throat> an insectivorous bat feeding um, on insects at a street light. I mean, you just you just have to stay at a particular street light, and you know, uh, and you watch these bats coming uh, time and again and eating insects. You'll notice that. a single insectivorous bat can eat well, can eat a lot of insects in a night i mean some estimates suggest somewhere between you know 2000 to 5000 mosquito sites uh, insects in a night per bat so and these are these are barely you know 6 gram bats that are that i'm talking about and 6 gram would be what smaller than a worker yeah smaller than a worker One tenth of uh, what your average toothpaste uh, tube weighs. Right? Wow. Toothpaste tube is eighty grams. So, uh, so that's how small these bats are, and they eat uh, up to a lot of their own body weight in insects every day. So, it is estimated that, um, uh, well, from from uh, from systems that people have studied, uh, particularly in the U.S. and um, in Indonesia, in the U.S. Uh, uh insectivorous bats uh, help reduce pest populations in corn plantations we have similar uh, results from rice fields and rice as you know is a, is a major source of nutrition for for the entire global south so that is uh, that so, so and i i can't i can't really pull out the figures but these these numbers range up to millions of dollars per year per farm oh. so these can be i mean this, it, so insectivorous bats really do benefit um, agriculture it, to a great extent on the other hand um, i mean it is it is assumed that they eat, eat mosquitoes even though from meta barcoding studies uh, where people have sequenced the dna of uh, all their prey remains uh mosquitoes do not feature to a lot of extent but you know bats being efficient nocturnal predators it is reasonable to assume that if uh, there is something controlling mosquito populations a lot of benefit could, could be given to bats mm-hmm. and um uh, in agricultural ecosystems we also know bats benefit uh coffee uh, sorry coffee plantations chocolate plantations uh wine plantations so you know uh, so there's a whole bunch of uh, ecosystem services starting from uh, important nutrition crops going all the way up to cash crops and bats are uh, you know so so bats are really in, important for us not just for our nutrition but also for our own recreation oh wow and that, so that was about insectivorous bats and i'll let uh, bahi talk about fruit bats yeah so fruit bats have their own ways of uh, providing services to the planet and uh, generally for plant sitting bats uh, pollination and seed dispersal are the main uh, uh, ecosystem services which they provide and they also provide dano and uh, which i will come to that later first first when it comes to uh, fruit bats uh, there was this recent study last year uh, which was published just quantifying the amount of seed dispersal which is been provided by fruit bats across different taxa and uh, If you think about fruit bats, disperse seeds in three different ways. They just uh, keep the fruits in the mouth and move to a different place from the foraging tree and drop them on the way. That is one way. They uh, uh, and otherwise they just chew the thing on the foraging tree itself and they just uh, chew and just drop it immediately under the tree. That is one way uh, for short distances. And they also consume them and when they fly and they reach a second site, they just defecate them. So these are the three different ways in which fruit bat disperses the seeds. And uh, it was found that uh, both smaller fruit bats and the flying foxes. are one of the long-range seed dispersers of many tropical plants and uh, flying foxes can disperse seeds by through defecation for more than 75 kilometers which is very crucial for certain plants uh, which uh, 
needs their seeds to be pushed more far away and uh, especially for plants which uh, uh, produces nocturnal anthesis and they require long range uh, seed dispersal services and flying foxes are the top uh, seed dispersers for such uh, commercially important plants and uh, fruit bats are important for pollinating many commercial uh, species for example uh, durian plants are one of the more uh, most dependent uh, plants uh, for uh, bats are one of the most important uh, pollinators for durian plants and you know the economics of durian industry itself and in india there are they flying foxes and all the fruit bats are visiting many commercial plants like mangoes uh, tamarind oil i've seen and uh, but we don't we don't have the economics yet but i can still say that uh, fruit bats are very mm-hmm. important uh, seed dispersers for our uh, economy also um, and next to the, next to that uh, uh, is uh, the guano services which i was talking about uh, so this is again an, an understudied aspect uh, in the indian ecosystem but in southeast asia and in many other places fruit bat guano or generally bat guano is one of the most rich uh, uh, menu for uh, farmlands and people used to collect them and use it in farm itself so fruit bat again there is since the diet is different uh, the co- composition of the nutrients in the guano itself is different between insectivorous bats and um, uh fruit bats and uh, one of the colonies which i studied was a fulvous fruit bat colony which was roosting inside an agricultural spring well where uh, uh, the colony size was around 10000 individuals and they used to excrete inside the well and that was the water which the farmers were using for their farmland and they used to casually report that uh, they have uh, noticed uh, bigger uh, tomatoes or the vegetables which they grow are having uh, bigger size compared to the other farms around which does not use this bat water but uh, we are trying to quantify this and seeing what how, how much of a difference this well water have with and without bats and that is something which we should actually quantify in the future but another service which is very important in uh, if you consider bats as a whole as rose was mentioning they are all killing insect pests in uh, agricultural situation and we are all of our uh, service which is the manure service we don't know if we can completely reduce the uh, usage of commercial manures but uh, if the cost is reduced for even 10 percentage it is good for the farmers right so those two ways are which uh, bats are uh, very important and fruit bats especially they are one of the wrongest seed dispersers and pollinators in the tropics and if so, i know correctly there are some species which are like pollinated only by bats is that correct at least have, yeah uh, so there is this uh, no go on yeah so bat plant syndrome is what yeah yeah but there is this concept called bat plant syndrome some plants mm-hmm. uh, attract their own pollinators and they target their sensory systems and display certain traits uh, like the, there are certain plants uh, at least in the new world it is very well studied there is another family which is uh, known to have plant specific bats uh, so there there are this one on one interactions and all but here most plants are majorly pollinated by bats but uh, i don't think there is an exclusive one on one relationship at least it uh, well deciphered in uh, our landscape but uh, uh, there are certain plants which are exclusively pollinated by uh, bats alone but in the new world it is well explored in uh, neotropics a couple of quick things that i wanted to add to what bhai was saying uh, particularly about guano um i had heard uh, in one of um, ranveer prat who's a celebrity chef mm-hmm. i'd heard in one of his talks uh, that in one of his videos that the mathania chili that is used to make a lal mas a traditional dish from rajasthan the that was also traditionally cultivated using bat guano and uh, and i don't know i don't i can't verify that but i'm sure you know in a in a desert landscape like that I, i'm sure that you know that's the most easily available natural manure because particularly because they have tons of bats roosting uh, in in abandoned buildings forts etc and the other thing that uh, i would also like to mention is uh, tequila the plant from which tequila is produced agave is also a bat pollinated plant so you know for people wow. who like partying uh, that's an important <laughs> trivia to know they should conserve bats <laughs> at all costs <laughs> i think that's uh, thank you rohit that's very yeah, yeah. interesting so uh, so just j- just yeah, to add for the me. ecosystem services i think i think rohit must have mentioned it if he missed it. so there are also this carnivorous bat species carnivorous bats just can in the pests which are very uh, big, big of a menace for uh, and there are bats exclusively feeds on small mammals and uh, rodents in the night so uh, so that's another important aspect which we should look into 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm going to break uh, break the um, uh, what should what should I say seriousness of this talk by asking you a very silly question. Uh, this has been asked by <laughs> lot of people. If Batman was one of the species uh, of bat, then what would uh, which species of bat it would closely resemble to? <laughs> you want to think about it <laughs> rohit bhai um we uh, i have never heard this question until now <laughs> so there is one flying fox which looks like primates so that is uh-huh. called as the monkey faced bat it looks kind of like primates but uh, yeah i cannot come it comes no bats <laughs> no but uh, but whoever whoever has that question if you're planning to make uh, an animated movie on bats uh, i mean do get in touch with us we'll probably help you find the right species to get inspired by <laughs> we'll do that <laughs> okay yeah. rohit uh, i have a question for you rohit i remember uh, again being in uttarakhand with you dehradun and uh, seen the joy on your face when you rec- uh, got your uh, call recorder bad call recorder so i just wanted to ask you uh, what is the value of creating such a library uh, of equal equation call uh, is it important from the research point of view or from the conservation point of view and how uh, what is the status of the library at this point okay uh, yeah it's 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 important both from uh, well it has three importances actually research conservation plus public uh, outreach and which but some could i mean which you could say is a part of uh, conservation but you know uh, i would i would really put it on a league of its own because public outreach nature education really is you know a whole field in itself so um, the value of creating a bat call library is because you know you can listen to bird calls so people have people and people really like listening to bird calls and uh, at leisure or for bird watching and or for research and you can you can listen to them and identify different species but for bats you can't hear them so you have to record them using specific ultrasonic uh, recorders and uh, it so happens that different species or sometimes different uh, genera of bats produce very different calls from each other now um, so that is well so it helps from the research point of view but why how does it help from the con- point of view of conservation imagine uh, and this is something that you know i would really like to do in in uttarakhand at some point specifically in my study area imagine uh, you uh, the audience might know about camera trapping right so you 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 go out put camera traps and that's how you estimate tiger numbers for example uh, in a in a population imagine if you could put automated uh, ultrasonic recorders at specific places year after year in uttarakhand you could see how bats are for example responding to climate change as the temperature is warming our bats which predominantly occurred in lower elevations at one point are they moving up to to higher elevations so you know so and and you could use the same approach even in cities uh, to do a long term monitoring pro- program because not everybody is trained to go out and catch bats but if somebody is trained to uh, record bat calls in a standardized manner you could build a citizen science initiator to to record bats even in cities and find out and answer questions like you know how are green spaces important for bats mm. are bat distributions affected by levels of pollution noise pollution or light pollution or increasing urbanization and we can we can actually generate long term data on these the problem is okay of course not every species can be identified from their calls but you know we can still get broader patterns about how bats are responding to various anthropogenic problems and of course the nature conservation part of it uh, the nature education part of it is related uh, i've noticed that calls are a really interesting way to get people fascinated because you know these are ultrasonic calls that are being synthesized to make them audible so people really uh, like listening to these calls and 
you can you can do back walks with with a bunch of students and this is something i've done only a couple of times i would love to do it more number of times where we take a bat detector a bat recorder along and we show all the recordings that of bats that are calling live in real time so people can see those recordings and you know what they thought was just one species of one tiny black blob flying in the sky turns out to be five six species in their own vicinity i think it it really helps people associate with their immediate urban environment now oh, that's lovely to know and also the update on status of your library right. where it so is Okay, so right now I have recordings of about 57 species out of 130 uh, or so species from India. So it's really, I mean, it's you know, it, as you can see, it's uh, it's um, uh, it's it's at a it's at a growing stage right now. So uh, I it really, like I said at the start, bat research, no matter what you do, turns out to be new. So people who are listening, if any of you are uh, our master students or a hobby uh, nature enthusiast do consider, you know, um, learning more about bats so that together we can help this library grow and um, and fulfill all the three uh, purposes that uh, a bat library, will, a bat call library, would solve. Uh, actually, a related question, uh, Rohit. When you were talking, I just got curious because uh, birds generally have more than one. Call usually they have more than one call. They also have a song. So do uh, bats also have a repertoire uh, which is more than one echolocation call? Uh, yes, they do, uh, and we don't know too much about it because you know, of course, with uh, with birds you can observe them and you can record them simultaneously. So you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can guess why they are pro calling. So a bird singing to a mate and then the female pops up. So you know, okay, that's a mate attraction call. We can't observe bats to that same level, but bats do have a repertoire of calls and uh, and that would also be important if we, uh, if we record bats uh, throughout the year. Then we, mm -hmm. then we might be able to understand if they're making certain calls at certain times of the year and link them to their breeding cycles or to their breeding cycles or, or, or uh, stuff like that. For example, in Europe, we know where bats are very well studied. We know that uh, a certain species of bat called the common noctule, and I think we have a recording uh, here, uh, which, uh, which probably Shashwat can pull out. Um, they sing, they sit on uh, trees and they sing to the females in autumn, which is their breeding season. So, but whether that happens in India or not, we don't know. And uh, we can, we need to, um, yeah, we need, we, we really need to track our bats and record them throughout the year to understand this better. Wow. Uh, thank you, Rohit. I, I, I mean, I hope we could talk about this more and more. It's so fascinating. Um, Bahi, I have a next question for you. When I was going through the work that you have been doing, and you also shared that uh, um, about these harem uh, making males. Um, so that's a very fascinating behavior. Another fascinating behavior that you have studied or you have, uh, it's mentioned in the work that you have done is uh, allo maternal behavior. So I was, when I was reading about that, I was amazed at how little I know about that. And I just wanted to know what is the value of, um, if you can just share the value of studying bad behavior um, from, from, from the conservation point of view or from the research point of view, I think that would be very interesting for the viewers. Yeah, thanks for bringing that, Monica. But uh, yeah, so I actually observed allo maternal care because that study itself was from a captive colony in a different species. But uh, we have had, uh, seen so many other, especially mother pup uh, interaction uh, things in fruit bats. Uh, in different species, there are different stories to tell. Uh, and uh, so, as Rohit was mentioning, uh, not all vocalizations and calls can be observed with actual behavior itself in uh, many insectivorous bats and many bats in that case. But flying foxes are an exception in that because they are very vocal and the certain things you can actually understand with behavior one is the mother pup interaction itself and uh, that is really fascinating to see and flying foxes as we all promote uh, they bring wildlife to our places like they are present in cities and if you take any city colony in bangalore for instance there are many flying foxes. behavior thing can be observed very especially in summers so uh, 
bats actually uh, normally they carry their young ones and fly because they are the only flying mammals so they carry their young ones and fly but after a point of time they drops become too heavy and they leave in the roost in the roosting tree and then uh, go out for foraging this behavior is called as the pup parking behavior they park all their pups near a foraging tree near the roosting tree and they just go when the mothers come all the young ones will be parked uh, in the same place but the mothers will give certain vocalizations and the pups will also respond to that and mothers will come and actually pick up her own uh, kid from the whole uh, bunch of other uh, young ones and they'll take this happens every night uh, the mother just emerges out leaves the parks the pup near the roost tree goes for foraging and comes back by middle of the night or early morning picks up her pup uh, just by vocalizations and this this is something very common to observe in uh, any flying fox colony in their mating season mating is from march to may in the summer and next is in the july to november this is a very common behavior which anybody can observe that is one uh, mother pup interaction which we can see and uh, the uh, whole mating behavior system itself is different for different species and how they deliver their pups that is another interesting thing that is where the allo maternal care work uh, brings brings more knowledge into it we still don't know how it is happening in our flying foxes but that was on a different species where they have shown that uh, when uh, the experienced females come and help the inexperienced mother uh, to help in delivery. so they come and tutor the inexperienced females so act as midwives and just show how to like they come and walk the mother to in front of her like to push the pup out or so flying foxes as they hang upside down they come upright uh, two main reasons one is during this kind of childbirth and due to due excretion but uh, if the mother misses this pup while delivery it's a costly thing because they have only mm-hmm. two breeding seasons and losing any pup is such a costly event so uh, in a altruistic point of view in a social uh, system it is really important for the whole colony so i experienced my, what this paper itself suggests is like experienced females come and help the inexperienced mothers to get the pup safely out so if in first picture you can see in the left most uh, one of the experienced female which is hanging upside down is trying to get the pup out so the pup is just coming out of the mother and she is trying to help her to get the uh, pup out the second one is tra- like trying to act as a cradle and safeguards the young one to come out and the third one you can see one uh, female is uh, imitating the way, how to push during the childbirth and like she is trying to show what the other female who is having a pup which is coming out she is just showing how to get the pup out so this is just how childbirth happens in one species of 1400 and odd species but this is not the case in all species some species deliver even upside down and uh, we, we still don't know how this thing happens in uh, our flying foxes but this is on interesting behavior itself so understanding behavior in any animal is interesting and studying uh, uh, fruit bats especially is uh, even more fascinating because uh, they have this bring up bring in so many new things which we not even realize so as you said like in an urban situation this is one species which many people can see in the evenings but we don't realize these pe- these animals have such interesting behaviors which they have which which they show pretty much on a daily basis or a nightly basis and this is something which we can use uh, to give or outreach and conservation we can show children uh, these species are uh, uh, right in the in front of them and make them understand how good these animals are and how beautiful their behavior is itself wow they they are more mammal than i thought they would be so interesting to know yeah. about this pup parking yeah. behavior i mean it sounds like my mother leaving me in park and coming back and calling my name and only me going to my mother yeah, exactly. thank you so much yeah. bhai that's really fascinating yeah. um now i want to come that back moms to that are that uh, moms are very interesting in many aspects so no, we can talk yeah. about that moms separately itself there are so many interesting things about that uh-huh. moms because the pup should catch hold of her nipple fly and it's so many so much of things are there to talk just about bat moms in all species oh, wow yeah so nice um i wish uh, more and more student uh, i mean follow your path and learn about bat behavior this is so fascinating and um, i'm just like feeling embarrassed uh, whenever you are sharing more information that i know so less about bat but anyway coming to uh, something very serious is that bats are probably one of the most misunderstood uh, animal group and especially during um, covid pandemic or nipah virus outbreak we have seen people resorting to some extreme measures of getting rid of bats now we know that you both talked about how important bats are 
Um, and this is something that I know that other species, not only bat, but the other species are also carrier of some uh, diseases. So I want you to unpack this for our audience, how uh, bats and other species also are carriers of such zoonotic uh, diseases and what can be done to prevent any outbreak, what um, authorities, what individuals can do to prevent any such outbreak. And if there is one, then uh, what precautions they should be taking. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, I think, um, I mean, in order to unpack this, I think the first thing that we need to tell the audience is to just recollect their own experiences with bats. And you know, bats have been living with us for, for a long time. Even though we, we would like to say, we would like to admit that, you know, oh, uh, these bats are, these bats spread diseases and all of that. Uh, we've, been, we've been sharing space with bats for a very long time and these things don't happen very often. These are A, diseases that are rather rare in nature and, uh, and two, bats know how to, bats are way better than, bats have been practicing social distancing before any of us have even, had even heard of that term. Yes. So, you know, so they, they really can live among us. And yet in our houses, there are bats at any given point of time. Yet, and it's just that we haven't seen them. So bats, it is, and, and I'm not saying this to discount, uh, you know, or to say that, oh, bats are, you know, uh, that bats, you, you have nothing to fear from bats. Bats are wild animals and they do carry uh, viruses. They are the important hosts of many vi viruses. Um, but what I'm trying to emphasize is that there's no need to panic because uh, because bats themselves know how to how to distance themselves from humans. So um, um, yeah, and I mean I think I think this is where I would like to start. But if you want to if you want to continue with some technical aspects or something like that, we can. Uh, yeah, I mean I I, I will let you uh, take on from here. Yeah, so pretty much that is what I was also coming to say. And uh, uh, when it comes to this carrier thing, uh, bats are known to carry so many viruses, not just the recent uh, ones like COVID and NEP and all. They have been known to carry viruses for a long time, and it's not something unreported and all. Just like any other wild animal, it's not just bats. Any other wild animal is also known to carry so many viruses. And the problem is uh, we we don't need to get panicked and go and take take it out on these animals, any animal for that case. But we know that this transmission happens and we should focus on the mode of transmission rather than the animal itself. And when it comes to bats, bats are carriers. Carriers means like the viruses as in the bat's body, immune system. Bat immune system is kind of different uh, uh, compared to other mammals because they are flying and their metabolic uh, costs are different compared to other mammals. And they keep the viruses in check inside their body. But when it spills over to a different uh, system, that is when uh, the whole transmission things happen. And uh, rather than focusing on uh, the individuals itself, which, which was just happened as it's shown in the slide. So when the whole uh, COVID outbreak happened, we were getting news articles like this, we were going and trying to cut out bat trees, sealing bat caves and trying to kill bats in large numbers. That is not the solution. So we need to understand how it is getting transmitted because this whole zona transmission risk itself is very rare. It's, it's rare and uh, the spillover from one species to another species, this crossover is an extremely rare event. But when it's, when it's happening, then we should, it, it, it just takes over any other animal like that. So we should focus on the mode of transmission, how much intermediate hosts are there and where these animals interact. Are they interacting in the wild? Who take them into a stressful condition where they are forced to interact? And those are the areas that where we should focus rather than taking it on the animals itself. But that is what happened, not just in India, but across the world. So you are going taking out on these animals. But uh, this is where uh, the important aspect of having working with urban and semi-urban public comes into picture. So uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see this is all happening in the urban situation only. But what uh, I personally experienced in uh, the uh, rural area, that was completely on opposite effect. The, uh, as Rohit was mentioning, they are clear about all these things. And even they're not understanding the biology and the risk associated with these things. There are so many uh, villages, especially, I'm just giving you examples from Tamil Nadu, but there are other examples across India. So here is an example where uh, this is a small temple in a village where uh, bats roost inside the uh, tower and uh, not just bats, uh, other wildlife like gecko, snakes roost. And when people offer their prayers to the deity, if a bat flies out, they think the deity has answered their prayer. And uh, uh, so they, they just conserve this bat habitat just because of this belief system. 
and uh, even if as researchers if i want to go and study these bats in these places they don't allow me that easily they think i'm trying to come and harm them and they already have this conspirational thing running around this is also happening even after covid so if you go to the next slide there are even more examples so yeah can you go to the next slide yeah so there is so when it comes to flying foxes uh, there is this concept of sacred flying fox which is common across tamil nadu where uh, inside a village there will be a small village deity it's not a, like a big temple and all there will be a small deity which will cover a particular area of sacred group and the flying foxes roost inside these groves and uh, these are undisturbed just because these public uh, just fear the wrath of this deity and they just conserve this uh, whole habitat as such and that kind of protects the whole animal and their ecosystem and there are so many cave temples like this in the left you can see in the right you can see so many cave temples where people the humans go together and without uh, much conflict among both of them e- each understand their distances and they just uh, conserve the animals habitat just like that you can go to the next slide so this concept of sacred groves and sacred caves are very common and uh, this uh, especially for flying foxes it is very important they just don't uh, particularly save just the roosting tree but they also save the whole habitat so if there is a fruiting tree inside a sacred grove and uh, nobody no humans are allowed to go and take fruits from that they are just left for the animals especially for the bats if you do that uh, if you go and try to take fruit they just fear the wrath of the deity and people are scared of these kind of big systems and they just don't touch these animals or their habitat and that is very this is all happening in the rural part of the rural parts of tamil nadu but, but when it comes to urban areas uh, because of social media misconception and so many things we are taking it on animals without understanding the whole thing like rotted out like we there are so many we we have been living with these animals for a long time and there is no need to unnecessarily go and disturb them now so this is common across tamil nadu and there are examples in kerala also so bats are considered as protectors of protectors of villages there's of black and uh, so uh, uh, so many villages consider them they want their bats for their village so that is how the connect is there in rural india yeah and just to just to add to that uh, i think what we what we need right now in cities is there are three there wait that uh, i think two or three important steps that people people can follow when interacting with bat a if you see a bat or if a bat has fallen down do not try to handle it because uh, unless you are trained to do so or if you are compelled to handle it in order to save the bat wear gloves uh it is also important that you don't come in contact with their feces so if you are for example if you happen to visit a cave or a fort where there are a lot of bats just try to put a simple mask on and follow basic hygiene rules of washing hands and you know taking a bath after you come out and um another thing of course very important in the context of nipa do not eat fallen fruits particularly mm. those that have bite marks you know because it's not just about bats any animal if you come in contact with any wild animal saliva it's not uh, it's not uh, the right situation to be in and at the same time from research from the research point of view what we need is a thorough understanding of how bats use urban landscapes you know what are the historical reasons or what are the current reasons that allow flying foxes to uh to live in cities and to to thrive in cities what are the what are the reasons um so you know so these these are going to help in understanding in predicting for flying fox movement and in a, or in predicting back movement across landscape so that we can we can understand okay uh, the interface between humans and bats might change here so this is where we need to actually so the whole you know of a whole an entire one health concept that we need to follow in order to to uh, to coexist uh, with bats which we are already doing but just that you know with experiences like nipa and corona we need to uh, up the game from here on thank you rohit actually that was a question yeah, from one of add, my colleagues add, add to that please please yeah yeah so all, always uh, like after nipa and covid it is always best like anyway like we uh, mean way to understand is the whole how this whole disease transmission happens and it's always a healthy practice to not eat any fallen fruits or any bit marked fruits that is the only thing which we should be mainly focusing on now and uh, so having an one health approach like we should uh, not just po- focus on the host organism or the like humans which we get them we should try to un- like like decipher the whole pathway and we should try to have a whole holistic understanding to have a healthy human coexistence rather than attacking bats or just getting scared of them so we should have a we should find a holistic approach which is the one health approach which rohit was mentioning hmm. 
Actually, one of my colleague asked me uh, to ask you this question: How to uh, deal if uh, how to deal a situation if you find a, a bat uh, baby or a juvenile bat? I think you have already answered that. Thank you so much, Rohit. Now I'm coming to um, I mean because um, we are talking about bats in city, so I just wanted to know. Um, I mean, there are bats in cities, especially let's say flying foxes. I've seen them even in Delhi, uh, <laughs> one of the most uh, urbanized areas in our country. Um, but our cities are becoming noisier and brighter at night. And I got to know from Bahi that there are bats that uh, actually use vision and not uh, uh, echolocation. Um, but I was just wondering that uh, how um, background noise, how uh, brighter sky affect their ability to forage, to um, feed on uh, their food resources. So uh, both of you, please answer that. Uh, well, you can yeah, go first I because you've already worked on this. Bed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So light pollution is recent interest like in the last two decades and they're trying so this only very fruit bats. There is very limited studies as uh, as of now. There are a few studies which has explored this in fruit eating bats. And in this particular family, Tiropodidae, which is the old world fruit bats, there has been no study. And uh, uh, what I was hearing was in these two species. One is the cave roosting fruit bat, and one was this open roosting flying fox. And I found species specific. Effect. Under uh, the insectivorous bat point of view, uh, some for, for, for some species, uh, it could be an advantage to have more light because more light means insects and that will increase their foraging opportunities. And that has been reported in many insectivorous species across the world, species specific effects of light pollution. For some species, it is increasing their foraging time. For some species, just avoiding uh, light polluted areas because they have higher risk to get eaten by predators and stuff. Fruit bats, we had nothing, like we had no at all. And even now, there is so much to explore in this avenue. And what I found is the same. So the cave roosting species, which is not exposed to much daylight, has delayed its emergence when it comes to when it was exposed to more light pollution. In the naturally lit conditions, which was in an agricultural mm -hmm. well, this species started emergence uh, uh, 40 minutes after sunset. That's when mm -hmm. it starts to fly. And it comes back uh, very early in uh, civil twilight itself, very darker time points compared to other species. But mm -hmm. when it was in the temple, the same species initiated emergence only around like 90 minutes after sunset. Like it, was, it was delayed even more further. And this was a temple where lights were switched off after 9.30 in the night because these all the roosting in towers. And under just the towers, there were these uh, shops which were selling religious merchandise, which was lit. And they, these shops closed by 9.30 or 10. And that was the time when most of the colony, they were just waiting for the colony, like the human activity and light pollution to go down and they start their activity. And uh, when coming back also, uh, in the naturally lit conditions, they were coming back very earlier, even before sunrise. But what happens in the light polluted condition was they were coming even after sunrise, which was, uh, that is how they were compensating. They are already delaying their emergence because of this increased light in the evening. They are compensating it by coming back late in the early morning, which is potentially putting them at a very high competitive disadvantage because this is a species which shares landscape mm -hmm. with many other fruit bat species. And arriving late to a foraging site means they are losing access That's to good true. quality resources in an ecosystem mm -hmm. point of view. When coming back, they are delaying their, they are coming back very late, exposing their, them to day to day active predators in the morning, which is another potential risk for them in a species point of view. Overall, uh, what happens, this is just in a species and ecosystem point of view. In a physiology point of view, we don't know how much stress these animals are getting into because there are mm -hmm. also studies in other bats that their like, blood metabolites and stress levels are changed with respect to exposure to artificial lighting. Overall, we still don't know what is happening, but what I, should, I, I found was this cave roosting species is having this drastic delay in emergence when, uh, when they are exposed to artificial lighting. But for the flying foxes, an opposite effect was seen. What I found mm -hmm. was like uh, the like colony which was exposed to high levels of artificial lighting was uh, initiating activity earlier than the other colonies. So they were going out earlier than uh, the less light polluted colonies. And then a completely opposite effect was seen in the flying foxes. And uh, we still, st uh, we, we don't, uh, that is just because of the light pollution or the human activity or just because of other disturbances, like you said, background mm -hmm. noise, sound and etc. But uh, overall, kind of species-specific effect, and uh, the, uh, this is all a problem in urban landscapes. And that is where, like Rohit was mentioning, more, focus more on understanding how urban landscapes is affecting their behavior and different aspects. So 
in two in these two species itself we are finding drastic differences in their behavior with respect to light pollution yeah. and uh, we still don't know how their movement is affected we still don't know how their growth rate is affected there are so many other aspects which we should focus when it comes to exposing them to high light and this is just we are just starting to understand it and uh, as uh, you were mentioning flying foxes are a city dwelling species very little roosts are found in like forested areas at least in our experiences and uh, they are trying to ad- adapt to the situation but we have to stress we are putting them putting these animals in and that is something which we should quantify in the future hmm. wow. thank you bahi that's very uh, informative um but i mean i was also wondering that uh, i think one of our uh, um viewers also has this question uh, regarding cave tourism and its impact so i was wondering if um uh, actually it's from monica monica her palani she is asking there are any impacts on um, bad behavior due to tourism acti- activity and how they vary across altitude uh, so i think that's very uh, interesting question um because i mean now even caves i don't know at higher altitude but at lower altitude i think that's something that is picking up cave tourism is picking up so um what apart from cave tourism do you want to uh, talk about other threats that are affecting um, uh, bats in india and uh, in particular if you can answer this particular question by monica um okay i'll take this question uh for uh, i mean because this is something that has been on my mind for a while uh, that you know um if you look if you visit archaeological sites in india particularly and bahi has worked in some of them so he can give personal uh, uh, i mean he can he can give uh, he can talk from his own experience uh, but at least you know in archaeological sites that you visit in india you notice that the archaeological survey of india really hates bats and uh, because their mandate is mostly preservation of the monument and increasing in- and increasing tourism so um, so you know and bats bats poop all over the monument so it imp- increases the restoration effort and of course because there are bats people are scared they keep pooping so people don't want to uh, visit such places so that's why bats have to be driven away so tourism uh, i mean we don't have specific data on this and that is something that uh, that somebody should really go out and study we don't have specific data on how abundances of species have varied with the onset of tourism in certain places and as we know from uh, from around the world cave tourism actually can have can have very drastic impacts not just on bats but all cave fauna because you know caves by nature are supposed to be very very dark environments and when you put lights into such environments it leads to growth of algae which were never there because you know then there there's light and then they start photosynthesizing in the absence of light such algae can't photosynthesize so you know it changes the entire microbial and uh, environment of the cave so uh, so what we do, and on top of that different species I and mean, different species of bats uh, use caves for different purposes and they use caves for in for differently in different seasons so some caves might only be used for uh for raising young ones other caves could would only be used for uh for hibernating so you know and and there is ample opportunity for bats to roost in archaeological sites in india provided we can create this environment where people appreciate bats and we can uh we can collaborate with the asi to to understand how bats are using uh, those particular sites in different seasons so that then we can come up with strategies on uh, you know on allowing bats to use the cave separately and allowing tourism to prosper on other sites there can be uh, no go areas for example when bats are breeding uh, mm-hmm. at other times when bats have become used to human beings and provided humans can also tolerate them by wearing a mask you can probably allow uh, tourism to happen so those those were my two cents and bahi can add more if uh, needs to so one self direct one most there i would have my bhai your audio is breaking for me um, what do you for you rohit is it yeah. can you hear him clear uh it is breaking i think now it 
Yeah. Yeah. Can I share it now? Yes. So there are two yes, aspects yes. of this. One is like uh, uh, as Rohit told, so what to have uh, it's, uh, itself super like tourism itself to coming to the archaeological sites where these bats roost and do tourist activities. One is mm-hmm. like uh, our big rolling species. They are known to roost inside the uh, this uh, cave situation, going and destroying many activities. Southern India, the temples and these structures are very good alternative sites for cave-dwelling species. And that is why they come to the thing. So, understand this whole dynamic of the English. See, when they are coming and when they just they need to come to and interact with humans, that is one about these. The colony size didn't burn with species, but when it comes to breeding time, and when the pups are mature, they almost doubles. And the animals, their isolated corridors, they just come out and over, like they just come and just probably come to the That initiates, sometimes people are hurt to wipe out the hole during those times. I think I'm still having trouble in hearing you properly. Me too. I am still having trouble uh, hearing you properly. I think I'll just uh, request, um, I mean, it's a question for both of you. I hope your network improves. Um, this is regarding the type of plants or type of trees that we have been planting. I mean, urban ecology is something that I am personally interested in. And I've been trying to understand the impact of uh, non-native or ornamental plants or trees that we are planting in urban areas. So from bad perspective, which are using trees from uh, for roosting and foraging, I was wondering if it's the plant architecture or the tree architecture or the species that is important. And does do, I mean, do tree species matter to uh, uh, bats? I mean, uh, or it's the architecture that matters. So, um, so I think in in certain species, for example, the architecture and the species uh, are correlated. For example, palms. I mean, palms really always form uh, an umbrella-like shade, and that is something that uh, species like short-nosed fruit bats, which are very common in cities, particularly in Bangalore. I mean, you stand on the street and you will hundred percent see a short-nosed fruit bat, even with your eyes closed. That's how common they are, and they like to roost on, particularly on palm trees, because palm trees uh, a provide the shade and on top of that um, the males when they make their harem sometimes they they clip the palm leaves in order to make a a, a, you know a a tent for uh, for the entire harem so uh, so that that's uh, so palms are useful for short nose root bats uh, in that sense the other plant uh, that is uh, non-native and uh, is really exploited by short-nosed fruit bats are Singapore cherries. And that is one of the reasons why uh, Bangalore probably has such high densities of short-nosed fruit bats because, you know, you have Singapore cherries all along the roadside. So if you stand at the roadside, you see plenty of bats hovering around the Singapore cherries. Whether that has downstream consequences for native for, uh, flora, uh, mm. We do not really know. So, you know, even though the bat is happy, is mm. the city really, um, you know, we don't know what, I mean, we need to know what we are envisioning for urban biodiversity before, mm. you know, thinking about whether, um, yeah, whether animals, I mean, if we want the animals' prosperity, maybe single Singapore cherries are great for a lot of birds, but do we really want that? Uh, is it happening? Is it having negative consequences for urban flora? We don't really know. Hmm. Wow. And here is the species for our viewers. Um, uh, Bahi, I think you can also answer this question. I was asking um, whether the tree architecture or the species matter. Uh, I mean, in case of birds, we would call it like habitat structure or habitat composition, uh, which is more important to bats. So do you want to answer that with respect to your species? Yeah, so uh, as uh, Rohit was mentioning, I started with this harem-making species and they were very common in palm trees in Tamil Nadu. 
but when i moved into kerala for uh, my phd i could not find any palm trees and i could see the species right in front of my eyes but so so hard to find their roosting but later i realized they are known to have alternate uh, tree species also like not just the palms so yeah can you go to the previous slide so the first uh, yeah so this is the species so you can very commonly see it is also called as the dog faced fruit bat it also has a you know, it's one of the cutest bats you can find <laughs> and this is a species which just flies uh, at human eye level so you can just commonly see them but finding a roosting space uh, places because they are highly correlated with this tent structure itself as rohit was mentioning the male should alter the tree foliage and i've observed so many interesting behaviors in the tent making itself they kind of decorate their tents they try to chew and stick things on the tents to attract females where they are very uh, meticulous in making this tents in their tree foliage itself and when it comes to and in the urban situation we still don't know where they are roosting i have also seen them roosting in bu buildings but uh, most of like this is a harem making species and uh, trees they need sp particular species of trees to make this kind of harem they can't roost in any places but when it comes to flying foxes there is no general trend like specificity for trees flying foxes they just need a large tree they roost from neem trees to ashoka trees to fig trees to they just need a big branch which can hold the, hold their body weight and that is how they, there is no specificity for flying foxes but they need trees at least the short nosed fruit bats can uh, are, like i've seen them in buildings but flying foxes it's a big problem if you lose trees and they need big trees for them to survive and for the cave roosting species uh, uh there is this interesting trend where the fruit bats for cave roosting fruit bats are known to occupy like open like the entrances of the caves if you have a multi species colony there are these reports but the echolocating ones are known to roost inside further because they have this ability to use echolocation and they don't need to rely much on light so there is this trend of different species occupying different places within the cave itself so for uh, in a cave roosting species that is an important thing but when it comes to tree roosting species it is just these two which i can think about for in a roosting situation foraging mm -hmm. they need foraging trees fruiting trees are very important and by personal mm -hmm. experience most of these bats are coming in foraging in uh, our backyards only we might not realize it because flying foxes are very quick when they come to forage they just hang in the tree and they just spend hours of time in the foraging trees they are very quiet only you will notice them if you are going and looking for them so they are using our backyards and we need our foraging fruiting trees for these animals uh, at this point i'll ask you uh, our viewers question um, bahi there is a question for you how many varieties of flying foxes are there in india and are they really the biggest one in the world so generally so the picture on your uh, screen is a sleeping flying fox which is a very rare event because they don't they're just very they're very alert when it, when you go near them so this is one of the sleeping picture we got uh, during my observations so flying foxes are generally the largest of all fruit bats uh, they are getting their names because they have a fox like face and uh, india we have in the mainland india we have only one species which is the indian flying fox but there are other species in the andamans and other parts of the indian subcontinent but mainland india there is this only one species body size can go up from 750 to 1500 grams and wingspan can go up to 1.5 meters so this is not the largest of all bats there's this golden crown flying fox which is found in philippines which is the biggest so that whose body uh, like wingspan can go up to 2 meters but generally all flying foxes are big and uh, they occupy this open habitats in the, this thing in indian mainland this is the only species so if you see a flying fox which is flying in across the mainland india it should be this one species only okay thank you bahi uh, there is another question i think it is for for any of you who wants to take a, a stab at it there are there used to be many bat dinesh chaturvedi chaturvedi ji is asking there used to be many bats year back but now they seem to be coming down is due to urbanization or disease to bat like uh, the white bat nose one um i think it's very hard to answer because you know uh, it's based on perception and uh, we really don't have data to claim whether bat numbers are dropping even though you know studies from europe might tell us that uh, urbanization uh, is affecting bats uh, in europe uh light pollution is affecting bats in europe but then there are also species that uh that get better uh, that that get benefits with light so um it's really hard to answer that question in the absence of data but that is another reason why you know most of more of why we should initiate these projects in cities 
so now so that we can observe what the trends are five years or 10 years down the line and uh, with respect to white nose syndrome that the question deals with it's uh, it's a disease uh, that affects american bats when they are hibernating so Fortunately, we don't have uh, any. We 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 have been. We should not be concerned about white nose syndrome. But at the same time, it was. Uh, I mean, to give to to tell very briefly uh, the audience what it was. It's a uh, it's a fungus that uh, that that is commonly found in Europe, but for for from some reason it got introduced uh, into North America and it started affecting hibernating bats because you know uh, they are metabolically not active during that time, so uh, so they couldn't resist the fungal infection. So what that tells us that, you know, if not white nose syndrome, there could be another pathogen that we might accidentally introduce into our bats. So a good practice to follow is if you are going into caves before visiting caves, follow hygiene practices, you know, uh, try to try to uh, wash yourself properly before visiting a cave so that you don't introduce something from another continent into our bats. Hmm especially your boots or shoes i think they carry a lot of uh, um, like pathogens invasive species so i think that soles of boots correct troy absolutely absolutely yeah okay uh, i think i have okay i think it's uh, we are uh, overboard <laughs> uh, we are i think uh, engrossed in the talk and discussion we forgot uh, that we have passed our time but anything uh, anyway i think um, our viewer would be interested to know more uh, about uh, bats rohit and bahi after a wonderful um, i mean stories and sharing some interesting behavior of bats. So I was wondering if you can share, uh, let's say if I want to begin now today, I want to learn more about that, where should I go? And are there, uh, as you were sh uh, sharing earlier, Rohit, are there bat walks that are organized or some other session that are organized in Bangalore, in other part of the cities uh, that uh, the, the people who are interested in bat can go about for? I have um, in our uh, in in the private chat. I've just uh, dropped a link, and okay. which uh, which Shashwat can maybe share with the audience. Great. It's called. Uh, it's an article that I wrote uh, a few years ago called "A Beginner's Guide to Bat Watching." So it will tell you all about how to get started with observing bats, uh, and specifically in cities because that's our natural habitat, right? So uh, so you can you can uh, take a look at that and. In case there are any questions, of course, Bahiradhan and I are both very happy to uh, for you to connect with us on social media or to ask us questions uh, yeah, via social media. Yeah, so we'll probably post your uh, Twitter handle or uh, Instagram uh, handle uh, as well in the chat section. Um, all right, I think we are at the end of our uh, session, uh, Rohit and Bahi, at this time. I was asked to do a very short coffee with current session with you. <laughs> so it's for both of you. What would be your bat name? Both Bahi and Rohit. If you were bats, what would be your name? Or what bat name you would have? I've already chosen painted I... bat for me on both on social media. <laughs> yeah. Mine is always Bahi, the greater about... short nose fruit bat. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, yeah. and Rohit and Bahi, both you are in both of you are interested in birds as well. So if you have to pick birds or bats, what would you pick? <laughs> uh, I um, I do not I do not pick birds, thankfully, because I have a hearing problem now, so I can't listen to a lot of birds, which is great because I can devote more time to studying bats but honestly one of the reasons why i did not choose to study birds was they're so pretty that i find them hard to reduce them to data and numbers <laughs> so <laughs> i will leave you with this very open-ended answer <laughs> what about you bahi <laughs> yeah i am not that good of a birder at all so if people who knows birding who comes with me will get super irritated because i know only crows owls and few birds which i'm learning now so <laughs> Always it's bad. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. And have you ever bitten God by a bat? Any, both of you or any of you? Always. 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 <laughs> yeah. And you're still alive. So there is a so lesson for our viewers. Yeah. yeah. 
what were you saying yeah. Mani? So, we call it as the bat we were, we call it as the bat kiss and yeah we uh-huh. got i got many kisses from flying fox itself through through the gloves so yeah flying fox bites are very memorable yeah. i mean if someday okay. i become famous i will i will hand over my gloves to uh, to a museum because it's full of you know yeah. tiny pin holes uh, all along yeah. this uh, all along wow. this finger Okay, I think that day will come soon, Rohit. Uh, do bird, do bats feed their young with milk or blood? Obviously, milk. <laughs> milk. They have better things to mm-hmm. feed them. <laughs> yeah. All right, I think that's all about it. So. Thank you, Rohit. Thank you, Bahi. It was such a wonderful session. I don't know about our audience and the there were some internet issues, but I enjoyed thoroughly. Um, got to learn so much about bats, uh, their behavior, uh, the value of uh, some interesting method that you have been using in field from, let's say, uh, creating a call library or studying them in urban areas. Uh, there are these threats that are affecting the bats uh, in rural as well as in urban area. And I really hope that uh, after this talk, uh, many more students approach you and uh, study, take up uh, uh, studying bats um, or even just bat watching. They start uh, become a citizen uh, bat watcher. I think that would be great. Um, so that's all uh, from my side. and I. Thank you all the viewers for tuning in. Um, a very, I think uh, we are meeting on this day. I wish all of you a happy new year. And please sign in to uh, sign in or sign up or subscribe uh, <laughs> to our YouTube channel, Nature in Cities, uh, to uh, be informed about upcoming uh, talks. There is actually a very nice talk lined up for the next month on a charismatic bird that I'm not going to reveal uh, as of yet. But yeah, hopefully next month we'll meet you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you.